Hi, everybody. I think this looks right. So let's talk about making beautiful circuit boards. Uh, I just shipped this project if you haven't seen it before. It's called Circuit Classics. Um, and there's a lot going on there. I'll talk more about how that worked. Um, before that, a couple years ago, I previously designed this circuit board, the Octopart PCB reference card. Uh, it's pretty cool because uh, it's a circuit board with a bunch of footprints so you can see while you're designing you know, exactly how big O201 resistor is and you remember never to try and surface mount solder that by hand again. You make that mistake just one time. Uh, the cool thing about this board, or one cool thing about it, was on the other side, this is actually an FR4 standard fiberglass circuit board, uh, but it's the only one I've ever seen that has 11 different colors on the reverse, which is a fun trick to do. Uh, the back, which you can kind of see here, was a resistor color code chart. Um, so through all of that, I've picked up a bunch of tips and tricks about how to make your circuit boards look pretty, and I thought I'd talk about them here. So you talk about making circuit boards pretty, and uh, actually doing research for this talk, I found this comment. I love it. Uh, this kind of represents the attitude, I think, of a lot of people thinking about, like, well, why should I make my circuit board beautiful? It says, you know, PCB is for using, not for beauty. Most PCBs have a silk screen layer. Go, go with that, right? Um, so the question is, why bother? Why, why do this, right? And I think there are actually a bunch of really good reasons why you would want to spend a little time finishing your board, making it look a little nicer. Um, you know, most circuit boards live inside of products, so most of them are never seen. But chances are, uh, you know, if it's work done for a company, another engineer will have to work with it at some point. Uh, and a well-designed circuit board, one that's like laid out nicely, has the property of being self-documenting. It's much easier for someone else to come uh, and pick that work up and go from there. Um, you know, or maybe you do it because, you know, making your, you know, spending a little bit of extra time making your own work just a little nicer is, you know, a way of respecting what you've done and what you've spent time on. Um, you can do cool, neat little things, again, largely for commercial work. If you add your logo, you know, it just adds a little finishing touch. Um, and, uh, you know, there are all kinds of reasons beyond that uh, to take it to the limit uh, or go way overboard. Um, there's something I want to say about this. This is one of my favorite quotes about uh, engineering. This was from a talk. I can't, couldn't find the reference in time to include it, but someone who was a, an FPGA designer said this, that you know, a good engineer can do for one dollar what anyone else can do for two. So I want to acknowledge here that you know, spending the extra time and attention and effort, and sometimes money if you know, it affects your manufacturing process, it is an added cost, right? So you are justifying doing this extra thing. Um, so I think that one reason to look for the tricks is that it lets you do this aesthetic additional thing in a, in an, uh, within, with an economy that's beautiful too. So when I think about making a circuit board beautiful, my first question is, you know, what's the goal? Who's, who's it for? And then, you know, what's your look, right, given that? Who's going to look at this? So I'll start out by just showing you a bunch of examples of boards that I've found and liked over the years, and they're vastly different from each other. And the goal here is to show you some of the different directions you can take your board designs in when you design them to be, you know, uh, good-looking circuit boards. So the first is, um, this is called the Ziffer uh, at openrandom.org. This is a hardware random number generator. I love this board. It's so minimalist, right? It's so just, you know, uh, there's almost nothing here. It's a white solder mask with just a little bit of black silk screen uh, to give the text. The parts are all laid out in this very geometric way um, and spaced out. And I think part of the goal here is, you know, anyone who would want a hardware random number generator is probably part of, you know, a crypto audience. There's a question of trust. And adding that, like, aesthetic detail here provides the ability to, like, inspect this, you know, to, to see exactly what's going on there. So this is a case of, like, you know, quite nice aesthetics that also have a functional purpose and communicate a little bit about the intention of the designer. Here's the other side of things. Uh, shout out to Evil Mad. I s hope they're in the building somewhere. I don't know. But uh, this is a board designed by Evil Mad Scientist called the Diavolino. And uh, I love this because, you know, it's, it's not about, uh, you know, being very, like, bare. It's actually, a, it's a board. It's a whole lot of fun. Um, you know, if you're holding this in your hand, you're probably going to do something evil, mad, or scientific. Uh, and it's, again, it's very simply accomplished in some ways in that it's, you know, a red solder mask 
black silk screen, same materials everyone else has access to, uh, but it's just done in this, you know, I, I would not have, if someone had tried to describe this to me verbally, I wouldn't have seen this, right? It's very, very creative, um, very personable. From another world, this is uh, from high-end audio. This is the Mark Levinson uh, 326S stereo amplifier. And this is one of the first boards I saw where you know I was really moved by just how beautiful it had been made. So you can see that the traces in the, in the board here, they've all you know, taken the effort to make sure the traces are all nicely radiused. Um, the solder mask over copper is traced in red to make those connections stand out even more against the you know sort of tan colored background. You can see all of the stages. You can sort of see how power flows through this board. So you know, on the one hand, you might hang it on your wall just to look at whether or not you knew exactly how it worked. On the other hand, if you walk up to this as an engineer, you know, you're like, you're my, my day is made because it's so much faster to see what's going on here. Here's another uh, more whimsical example. This is called the Standuino. Uh, this is by an outfit, I think they're in the Czech Republic, called Bastel Instruments. They make a bunch of like fun, cool, uh, like open hardware synthesizers. And I thought their whole operation was pretty neat because it was the partnership of electronics designers and graphics designers. And you can see what they've done here is they've added this, you know, sort of hand-drawn aesthetic touch. And, you know, if you, you do electronic prototyping, you recognize the right side of the board looks a lot like a breadboard, but it looks like a sketch of a breadboard. But it's a real breadboard, right? Like, it's, it's so fun. Uh, and then they've done a, a couple of other things here. You can see, I think they're using just two different drill hit sizes. So some of the holes are a little bigger than others. And then they encircle them, uh, if you look in the bottom left here, with uh, you know rings of different sizes, and the combination of those two simple effects gives it this whole like very fun, appealing look. Not to mention all the components that have been scribbled on, right? It's like a notebook page, right? It's been sort of torn out. It's kind of cool. Doesn't have to be expensive to be fun. This is someone's, I think, uh, you know, handmade board. I'm not sure exactly what it does. Um, it's pretty far from the Mark Levinson amp in terms of finish, but it is also definitely, you know, well-loved. I mean, that's clear when you look at it. Aesthetics can also be for, you know, information, communication, graphic design. This is actually a front panel, not a circuit board, but I thought I'd sneak it in there anyway. I really love the labels on this, where you have fluctuating random voltages. <laughs> I mean, I hope you get what you ask for, right, when you plug something into there. Uh, I love the, the graphics here where it shows the, you know, the distribution of the randomness that you're likely to get out on the, the you know, fourth, the third thing down. Um, so this is, might be another reason why you'd want to make your boards beautiful, is to, to communicate well. Um, and then this is my, my final example here. This is a board I saw recently, which I thought was pretty cool. This is the light blue bean by Punch Through Design. It's a light, uh, it's a Bluetooth um, dev board, uh, and they figured out some new thing I hadn't seen before. They figured out how to print onto the header, so that when you, you know your board's installed and you can't see what's plugged into what or like what what pin is where, they've taken the effort and just, this is just like a subtle detail, but I really appreciate it to print the name of the connection onto the header on the side there. And it makes a world of difference for when you're using it. So how do you, how do you get to this, you know, how do you, how do you know what you can change? And I think the answer here is you really have to know your tools. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that. Um, and that goes from not just understanding how your CAD tool works and what you can do with it, but also understanding how circuit boards are made and what goes on in the factory and when you ship it off, what's, you know, what's, what's the translation process that turns your idea into a real circuit board? Because when you understand that really fully is when you can start to play with it. This is a picture I included. This is a board from uh, before sort of computer-aided design was a thing. This is a hand-etched circuit board. And I wanted to start here because I think it's interesting to look at just the, the shapes uh, that circuit boards and electronics used to have that you don't see that often today. Because to me, this is uh, you know, a clear depiction of how, you know, if you look at modern hardware design, you get eight different angles to work with. You know, all of the 90s and all of the 45s. Uh, and I think that a lot of aesthetic design of, of hardware, and in some cases, 
uh, functional design is held back by the limitations of our tools. And I think that in 2016, we hopefully can all agree it shouldn't be you know, a necessary simplification to stick to just eight different possible degrees. Someone I really admire who's been playing with this is, uh, goes by Boldport. You can check this board out at boldport.com. Um, this is a throwback to an earlier time when that first board was made, when you know, everything was hand-drawn and then photo-exposed, and it was a very manual process. So this shows you know, what it would be like if you could you know, have that freedom and create aesthetically with traces of widths and you know, directions that you chose. There's another thing going on in this board that I think is important to look at. It's especially clear on the very top right, but this board is being held up to the light to make it translucent. That's something I used to do a lot when I was very first learning electronics uh, to let you see all the traces, and that's part of what you can see here. But another thing is you see at the top, the top left or the leaves on the side, um, in some places, solder, ma solder mask, the green lacquer, has been left off in order to just change how translucent that board is, which is an incredible effect because it gives you that light spring green looking color against the green, you know, but it's, you know, very simple in how it's accomplished. Um, and there are actually multiple different colors here shown as, uh, you know, copper on the back, copper on the front, lack of solder mask, presence of solder mask, gives you this huge palette to work with when you start thinking about it that way. So what goes on at the board house? I know some people in the room work at board houses, so forgive me for this part, but, uh, you know, you know, what are the parts that you, what are the parameters you get to control? So when I think about like, well, you know, how, you know, how do I get to shape this board aesthetically? And I realize that uh, a lot of this is intended for other things like, uh, you know, you might leave solder mask off part of a board typically to create like an antenna or something functional. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, it's not really an abuse of that, but you know, kind of, we're just doing it for looks here. Um, these, are, these are, you know, you have a lot to work with in my mind. Um, so as per that previous board, the, the transparency of your stack up is one way to think about how it might look. Um, what substrate do you have? Uh, you know, most boards I think that we work with are FR4, but there are a whole bunch of different materials. And this is really fun to look up and look into, right? Like FR1 is a type of cardboard, FR2 is, uh, you know, epoxy uh, something. Uh, I don't always remember all the codes. Uh, I learned, you know, there are Teflon substrate boards, extremely expensive, um, but really, you know, a really cool look. Um, messing with the solder mask color is interesting. You know, green is still the cheapest color, but you can start to look at uh, other colors, and if you're very nice to your board house, maybe even mixing them. Um, the interaction between silk screen and solder mask color, I think those are probably the biggest two in terms of picking your look, is picking which, you know, which colors for solder mask, which colors for silk screen. Um, finish is another thing that's not looked at often enough, which is, you know, if you've seen circuit boards that are, you know, gold coated, um, yeah, that's really intended to be like conductivity and so forth, but, you know, it does change the look of your board. And then lastly, looking at how the board will be finished when it's done, how it's gonna get you know, punched out of the panel that it's in, changes the edge of the board and how it feels and how it looks. It's another thing to think about. So firstly, substrate, here are a couple of examples. Um, this is you know, FR1, a sort of cardboardy material um, on the far, you know, the epoxy FR2. Uh, Teflon. These are all different from FR4 that we're used to working with that have, uh, you know, very different electrical properties and also very different looks. Um, as far as solder mask goes, these are some pictures from inside uh, Bay Area circuits. And, you know, until I saw this picture, even myself, you know, it's hard to really look at just how manual a process applying solder mask is. It really is you know, a matter of actually silk screening. Um, and so, you know, just, the, just the, the, the familiarity with that lets you communicate better uh, if you want to do something different with it. This is another bold port example. This is where I really wanted to dive into looking at um, that CalREC keychain 
right there really demonstrates, I think, how copper, uh, gold finish, lack of solder mask, presence of solder mask uh, can change the opacity of a board and, and create color effects. Um, on the left side, the keychain is part of this bigger board. It punches out, and you can see also darker and lighter colors of green um, present there also. And then silk screen. Um, so how many people here use Eagle? Good number. Uh, I, s I used Eagle to design all of my Circuit Classic boards too. Um, one cool thing you can do with Eagle is track down the Negasilk ULP, um, which lets you do this. This is a Makey Makey's board. Um, it's got a you know hot air solder level finish, so it gives it the, the copper. It has that silvery look. And you'll see the logo and where it says space and click. That's actually not silkscreen. That's, you know, silkscreen has been applied everywhere that's white, and the legend, the, the writing is in the negative space. Negasilk lets you do that quickly and easily using Eagle. Um, one reason you might do this is I think that um, it's still true most, most places today. Silkscreen tends to be a little mushier in terms of how crisp the finish is. And by doing, you know, your text with solder mask or, you know, in the negative space, you can get it to look just, just slightly sharper. This is another trick uh, Arduino's used. Uh, they got very crisp text. Uh, and when, I, you know, I first saw an Arduino, I think it was a 2007, it was noteworthy just how crisp their silk screen legend was. And uh, I found out at some point that that was accomplished by not using silk screen at all that they actually had managed to get two passes of uh, solder mask and that both uh, white and blue were at some point, I think, uh, done in um, dual solder mask layers. Be careful, you can take this too far. I've seen someone try to do three solder mask colors and the first solder mask color had like boiled and had bubbles in it. That board didn't make it out. Uh, so, you know, you can go overboard, but that's a neat way to go. Who knows about import bitmap? Yeah. If you've tried to use uh, import bitmap, uh, it's another uh, add-on you can get for Eagle. Uh, it lets you import graphics and converts the pixels into, like, very small rectangles. It's a decent and fast way to get a graphic on a board, but I have yet to see a silkscreen process that didn't reveal the rectangles, uh, and so I try to avoid it. I haven't used import bitmap dot ulp uh, in, a, in quite a long time myself. Um, what I like instead is this uh, program called import dxf uh, to polygons dot uh, ulp. Thanks, autocorrect. Um, and what it lets you do is if you have uh, SVG images, you can import them. And again, this is very Eagle specific. Um, but this lets you do, in this case, this is an example where someone made a PCB design. I don't think this was fabricated because that board edge is uh, awesome. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, was able then to take the SVG and import it as a polygon. And in Eagle, the polygons are much crisper, much easier to work with. Uh, if anyone's out there and can hear a request for a scaling tool in Eagle, that would link this like just super awesome, but it's pretty good for now. Uh, so communicating with the board manufacturer. This is super critical. Um, this is actually an email I got personally, and I'm not going to embarrass anyone because I think this was fair feedback. <laughs> if you ever get one of those emails where it's just like notes forwarded and like it's unclear whether or not you were supposed to actually personally read that, but anyway. Uh, I was working on a project. This is the, you know, the you know, hand-drawn data was on the board, and I intended it to be shown on the board, uh, but I got this comment back, which was, you know, it's taking forever to import this. The data quality is extremely poor. It almost looks like it was scanned from a paper drawing. I suggest you talk to your customer and ask them to limit themselves to just the actual design and refrain from sending in your paper drawings. Um, at that point, I said, like, oh, let me, let me explain what's going on here. Um, so don't do what I did. Let, you know, if you're going to do something really wild, let your, let your board house know. Some boards that I know were made possible due to excellent communication with the board house. Uh, this was a Seed Studio project called the Rainbow Duino. They somehow managed to pull off 
four different circuit, four different solder mask colors here. Uh, this was an RGB LED driver, uh, and it's again like just really neat. Uh, I did end up asking them, "How did you do that?" And they said, "Don't even try. It was really hard. We got it to work one time because the board manufacturer like really loved us and was a friend." But I do not recommend asking anyone else to try and do this for you. And then this is, you know, this is like the Apex high watermark. I don't even know how these boards were made, but I wanted to add these on here. Altera used to make these dev boards with like, there's like a color gradient here. On the left, that's, act that's not the screen, that's actually the board, it's like fades from red to blue there, and then, you know, the very uh, sharp contrast, blue and white there. It's like, it's very, very eye-catching. I don't know how the red to blue was made, but I assume they had to be friends with the people who made them. Another part of communication, I just want to flash this up here. This is, I always find this really fun. This is how I create my Gerbers. Uh, I put notes as a text bubble on the far left of my board's uh, off the board outline. Um, so I know it's not gonna get fabricated by accident, but that's part of how I communicate with people who make boards. I think that's part, that part is equally important to a well-designed circuit board and worth mentioning. Uh, and just to demonstrate the difference in uh, finish types, these are boards that have been finished different ways. Uh, the far left is that gold immersion process called an ENIG uh, electroless nickel immersion gold finish versus a hotter solder level here, um, which is a much simpler process of just you know getting all the pads tinned um, and level. Um, but these are, I think, the two most common finishes. And lastly, depaneling. So, not sure what the you know level of everyone is, but uh, when you ship your board off, if you get you know several of them made, they will be fabricated on a circuit board that is uh, a panel. So this is several panels of Circuit Classics boards, and you know when the boards are cut out, that process is called depaneling. Um, and there are a bunch of different ways this is done. And the method that's used changes the like edge feel of your circuit board, um, and also determines uh, you know how aggressive and cool of a shape you can have. Um, so pretty direct, uh, pretty simple uh, is called this process called mouse bites, where it's just a bunch of drills, and it looks when you um, snap that board along those perforated lines like a little mouse has come and taken a bunch of bites out of it. So. Uh, this got the descriptive name of mouse bites. Um, alternately, there's a you know method called V scoring where the board isn't cut through entirely. It's scored with just sort of like a conical shaped bit um, and then snapped um, either by hand or by like a machine that, uh, that depanalyzes the boards that punches them out. Um, and then lastly, this is uh, you know they can just be milled out, and milling produces, in my opinion, the nicest finish of all of the processes. Quick shout out to to a, to what's called via tenting. Um, I don't know offhand how you would do this in Altium, but I assume there's a way. Uh, this is done in Eagle uh, through changing your design rules, and I have found this to be critical to understanding how to. Um, add labels properly. So these are two different boards that are two different very similar boards that Sparkfun made, and you can see that on the uh, on the left their logo is right down the center, and it's like it's riddled with vias. You, you know, it doesn't look it doesn't look as good as it could. Uh, tenting is what uh, it's a process where the solder mask covers over the vias. So you can see on the left um, instead of the holes having large copper uh, radiuses around them or large exposed metal pads, the solder mask creeps up and nearly closes them over. Um, and sometimes, it's worth noting, sometimes tenting vias does cover them over entirely, and you can run into issues, like if you're tenting on both sides of your board and etchant gets trapped, it can just like eat at your board forever until that via stops working. So you want to avoid that, um, but yeah. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to show one more bold port example. Uh, this is a board where you know the front is shown on the uh, the right hand side here. The back is shown here, and this is again just a stunning example to me of how using just a couple of colors and techniques you can change the il illumination of the board. So this board mounted on a wall 
uh, in a dark room ends up having this amazing glowing effect. You can do all that. Almost all of these techniques are at play in the board I made. Um, you can see places where there's a lack of solder mask. Uh, I, one board house I quoted this with actually did ask me if I was trying to do some kind of crazy RF antenna thing with that. Uh, not this time. Um, I use restricted areas in the copper pads on the top left in order to produce symbols that show what the flood symbol uh, connection is. So, you know, ground symbol in the connection for the ground uh, flood. Um, you can see a little tinted via uh, in the bottom corner here, uh, done so purely to make that less visually apparent. Uh, bunch of other things. Um, the schematic that's shown on the board on the far left uh, was uh, traced and reproduced in Eagle uh, using the DXF to polygon technique. Um, there's another thing here which is not immediately obvious, uh, which is uh, texture is part of this board in, in practice where underneath the schematic are a bunch of uh, copper um, buses basically. Um, so you can you know, run your fingers over it and feel it. Same is true for the logo on the bottom. It just makes it just stand out just slightly more visually um, to make it worth it. The last thing that goes into all of this uh, is uh, I came up with techniques for, um, you know, I don't know why it says templating. I'm really sorry. I think that's autocorrect again. Uh, that's meant to be templating. So design rules, consistency, and templating. Um, this is another look at me, the, the design file for that board and the um, documentation areas, the rectangles, don't get made, but they were guidelines for how large of an area any of the circuit parts could take up, where the center lines are, where the title part goes, and uh, ended up uh, you know, being the template for all the series of boards I made. Uh, when you're driving for aesthetics, uh, you can sometimes end up doing a lot of iterations. Uh, I like to share this because it's how I keep track of my revs in Eagle, uh, and I hope one day a CAD program might have better support for sort of snapshots. Um, but uh, you can see here, uh, additionally, um, all of the physical revs by a count of about five made from the start to the end uh, of that project. And at this point, I just got the little, almost done it for my, with my time slot. I was going to do a, a demo um, to show how to import polygons to Eagle for your own designs, but we'll have to do that at the back of the room afterward. So, thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.